Hey guys and gals, Shane Stevenson, Director of Museum Collections and Curator here at the Buffalo Naval Park. And I've been looking forward to doing this video. It might be a little wonky, but I am going to be covering the ship's architecture for United States spaceship USS Discovery. Now I'm going to be talking a little bit about the book and of course about the movie as well. And there are some differences there. Uh, let me turn... Let me find the place in the book. <laughs> of course, I shut the book. Okay, here we go. So I must say that the uh, book and movie, certainly this is my favorite movie. It's in my top three, probably, of uh, books. Interchangeable. And this is the copy that I have. It's a very old and very used book club edition, um, and I like to read it every few years. So some of you may know, or most of you, if you've seen the movie, would expect the ship to look like this. And that's what we know. There is the ball in the front, the sphere, the associated uh, tankages, um, the 1MC, so to speak, uh, the lifeline, uh, the radar antenna dish that is in constant communication with Earth, and then behind that, the nuclear reactor and plasma drives. And the tanks in the middle, that long, narrow spine is that holds uh, all the associated fuels, heating and cooling for the ship itself. But if I show you what it looks like, what they envisioned Arthur C. Clarke and Stanley Kubrick originally, it would look more like this. And I will read a little bit from the book that describes this. The spherical pressure hull formed the head of a flimsy arrow-shaped structure more than 100 yards long, or about 300 feet, I guess. Discovery, like all vehicles intended for deep space penetration, was too fragile and unstreamlined ever to enter an atmosphere or to defy a full gravitational field of any planet. She had been assembled in orbit around the Earth, tested on a translunar maiden flight, and finally checked out in orbit above the moon. She was a creature of pure space, and she looked it. Immediately behind the pressure hull was grouped a cluster of four large liquid hydrogen tanks, and beyond them forming a long slender V uh, were the radiating fins that dissipated the waste heat of the nuclear reactor. Veined with, delicately veined with a delicate tracery of pipes for the cooling fluid, they looked like the wings of some vast dragonfly, and from certain angles gave Discovery a fleeting resemblance to old-time sailing ships. So we can see that here in the description and in the picture, that this was the vision that Arthur C. Clarke and Stanley Kubrick originally laid out for USS Discovery. I think when he was building a model for it, this was an early rendition, he felt that it looked actually too comical. So he changed it to what we know in the movie today. So let's talk a little bit about the pressure hull. As it's described, it's a 40 foot uh, diameter. Or, and it was the main living space for Dave Bowman and Frank Poole. Just getting to another screen here. All right, here's a really nice cutaway of the interior. As mentioned, she was 40-foot sphere. 
uh, there were roughly four main decks, all right? The upper deck, which held some antenna arrays, uh, and the lower deck, which held uh, stowage areas, things like that. In between, uh, there was the control deck where the bridge would have been, and then the central deck. So what we're looking at here is if you see on the right-hand side that red tube, that is the emergency access hatch. And in the movie, that plays a really vital role. Uh, right next to that, you see the space garage with the three uh, pod bay doors and the uh, three uh, extra extra vehicular uh pods all right above you'll see especially well represented from the movie uh hell's nerve center and then again the uh, bridge and then associated passage passageways in the back there before it it turns into the long spine you can see this uh the cylindrical shaped um uh the cylindrical shaped centrifuge which is the for the areas of the areas uh, of daily living, and um, so let's remove that, and let's get to the cylinder itself. Here's a real fascinating photo of the production of it, or behind the scenes. And again, the special effects in this movie are just utterly amazing for the time period. You know, I love the scene where the flight attendant is walking and then she's walking upside down uh, when she's working with uh, Dr. Haywood Floyd or catering uh, to Dr. Haywood Floyd when he's traveling to the moon. Yeah, I think it's when he's traveling to the moon. Um fabulous scene and here you see so they had a camera in the middle that could rotate around the pretty much you know the the centrifuge would move and uh they would mostly be in the middle just walking on the ground while the centrifuge moved around them here is another shot let's see If you're familiar with the movie, this is a pretty famous shot. It's Frank Poole taking a jog. Uh, and I'd like to point out here is that you see on the right and left-hand side of him, you'll see the pods that the that Poole and Bowman lived in. So you can see that's where they their birthing compartment, so to speak. And uh, you can see those are vacant. If you look above Frank Poole, in the centrifuge you can definitely see one and you also see two and a little bit of the third of uh the hibernauts right that's hunter comiskey and whitehead in the book those are their names in the movie i believe they change whitehead's name but i can't remember what it is offhand right but it's those are the three hibernauts and their hibernaculums hunter comiskey kaminsky and Whitehead. And of course, they never make an appearance in the book or the movie. You can't talk about Discovery without talking about this main character here. The Hail 9000. Heuristically program, prog programmed algorithmic computer, or the HAL. So HAL was created on January 12th of 1997. I think in the movie they might reference 1992, but we'll stick with the book, January 12th, 1997, in Urbana, Illinois. And he is the third rendition of this heuristically programmed algorithmic computer. Um, now he's in, in built into the discovery. 
And if if the crew became inca- incapacitated, he had the programming to finish the mission of going to Jupiter in the movie and Saturn in the book, all right, and to carry out uh, the discovery of TMA two, TMA one, Tycho magnetic anomaly one was what they found on the lunar surface. Once the sun and its rays and energy shone on it, it sent out that pulse, that radio blast towards Jupiter and Saturn. And so that's what facilitated the the building of Discovery to go see TMA2. Uh, He was friends, quote, with Bowman and Poole. uh, And... This really was the encapsulation of Arthur C. Clarke's and Stanley Kubrick's belief of artificial intelligence, which is a pretty poignant conversation today. So they took a decidedly negative view of technology. And in the beginning of the movie, it's working wonders. The AE 35 unit goes out. And you begin to sense there's some something going wrong with the Hale 9000. And uh, represented by his conclusion that the AE-35 unit for the radar antenna and radio antenna that's connected to Earth uh, has gone fault, faulty. When in fact it hasn't. All right, so it's interesting that they view technology as something good and also then something bad as you get through the book and the movie. Um, So uh, for the crew in the book, there's a 12 hour on 12 hour off shift uh, and redundancy was the key for them. All right. They wanted every day to be the same, but as the hail unit started to conflict with itself, because it felt like it was lying, all right? So it was felt like it was he was lying to Bowman and Poole, and he couldn't he couldn't reconcile that. And so he went faulty. In the book and the movie, of course, uh, Frank Poole is out in, in, in the pod. He's repairing or bringing, putting back in the AE-35 unit the second time. And of course, the space pod, space pod attacks him, rips out his oxygen, and sends him on his way. Now, this is where they diverge. The stories diverge a little bit. Of course, in the movie, open the pod bay door hail. I'm sorry, Dave, without your space helmet, you might find that difficult, right? Uh, so David Bowman goes out to retrieve Frank Poole in the movie. In the book, he's still on Discovery, and what Hell does is he opens the pod bay doors, and it releases all of the oxygen. And, you know, uh, Dave Bowman is beginning to asphyxiate, but he does get to a compartment uh, that's sealed and gets into a spacesuit. And then he can restore uh, oxygen back to the back to the ship but of course for hunter kaminsky and whitehead uh they pass away in their hibernaculums so there's a little difference there so from what we see again the 40 foot uh sphere houses four decks the whole ship is 400 feet in length the rotating living space uh, the arrow shaped structure on the back of the four hydrogen tanks. And then of course, in the movie, it's the tankage is along the spine with the plasma nuclear drive in the back. Uh, no armor and either ship. All right. And let's see. Let's see what other pictures I can show. That that might be it. Here is a picture again of the centrifuge with Bowman in the front, pool in the rear, and uh, the master himself <laughs> looking decidedly bored with their conversation. 
Well, I hope you enjoyed this video. Uh, I really enjoyed bringing it to you. It's pretty fascinating architecture. I'd love to do a, a little deeper dive or if I was a, if I was a, you know, blueprint drafter, I'd love to actually kind of draw this up and to really dig in. Now the sources again are the book and the movie. And I gave you a lot of how they describe the ship itself. Um, of course, throughout the book, he's talking a little bit about it, but he has that chapter where he kind of covers during Bowman's 12 hour rotation. He talks about the ship while uh, Bowman is actually working on a shift. So yeah, leave a comment, leave a question. Tell me how weird I am. I hope this video wasn't too wonky trying to bring up all the photographs. And uh, I hope you learned something. And uh, we'll see you again soon.